Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Man, good morning. It's good to have you all here. You can open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. That's where we'll be today. We're on our series on the road to the cross. On the road to the cross. And we're going to see and hear even next week, but starting this week, something I love about Jesus is that Jesus is not this weak, soft, um, gutless kind of guy. Jesus is brave. Jesus is courageous. And something else I love about Jesus is he's honest. Jesus doesn't try to bribe his followers with soft following and ease. Jesus is just upfront and tells you the truth that if you follow me, it's not going to be easy. I like that. And I appreciate that. There's no tricks with Jesus. Instead, he's very forward up front. And we're going to be in a place where really he has committed to the cross, his life to the cross for us. And he was brave and courageous, knowing that he was going to die on the cross for you and me. Now that is love, but that's also courage to be obedient to his father as well, isn't it? And so I love the fact that Jesus is this, this warrior king who goes forward to the cross to fight for us. So let's look at, at Mark 8, 31 through 38. And you might be wondering, what was he fighting? Well, he was fighting the curse of sin and death when he went to the cross for us. And he was committed to fixing that. And let's... I'm going to do this. I'm going to break down almost, almost verse by verse, and then we're going to try to apply this message. And if you're a guest at Calvary, I just want to give you a heads up that we keep it real and we, we teach the scripture and uh, there are tough things in scripture. And I think that uh, this is a scripture that is a challenge for us here in America to apply. And so this could, this could offend some people today. <laughs> This could make you uncomfortable today. Um, and it's really between you and God, too, and personal of how you can apply this message. And I also want to give you a heads up that I, I labored on this sermon for quite some time because there's so much that you could teach on this. And so I'm going to do my best to just pour out what God has given us uh, for today. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus began to tell them, that is the disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand or rebuke him for saying, such things. Now, this is the first time that Jesus begins to predict his death in the book of Mark, and he would do it three times. And this takes the disciples, and especially Peter, by surprise, but it's really all of them because Peter is voicing his, his thoughts on this for all the disciples. Because their steeped Jewish tradition is is that the Messiah would come and that he would set them free from any kind of physical powers and oppression, that he would even reinstitute more and more of the Jewish Torah and, and laws. And, and instead, Jesus came and he preached forgiveness of sins. He preached in parables and he preached, for, um, he preached uh, to love your enemies 
and all these things, and they're expecting more of this dominion ruler kind of leader. And so they are completely thrown off by this statement from Jesus. And Peter, out of his love for Jesus, but also out of his ignorance, rebukes Jesus. Isn't that kind of scary to think about for a moment? And it's kind of not his fault at the same time because he doesn't truly understand everything about Jesus at this moment. But what's really interesting is, is the, the scripture before this, even in chronological order, but also in our own text in Mark 8, Peter says that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus says, God has shown you this. And he, he pretty much, you know, praises him for it and says, wow, God has shown you this, that I am the Messiah. Other versions, Jesus says, or in other books of the, of the gospels, Jesus says, you are the rock, the church, which I, or I will build my church upon, the rock. So you know what's really interesting is, is one moment, G, uh, Peter is the rock, and the next moment, he's the stumbling block. Just like that, you know, it changes. Well, what do I mean by the stumbling block? Well, let's go to the next verse. Verse 33, then Jesus turned around and, and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded or rebuked Peter. By the way, the word rebuke that, that Peter used is the same rebuke that they would use to cast out a demon. So that was very sharp and it could be insulting to Jesus for Peter to say that. But now Jesus turns it back and says, get away from me, Satan. No one wants to hear that. You are seeing these things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. What is going on here? Well, this is reminiscent of the temptation of Jesus in the garden where Satan comes in and tries to tempt Jesus to release power and position, all take, take on what, what Satan can give him. And so Jesus sees through this and goes, Satan is trying to keep me from going to the cross because if I do, I will destroy his works. And so Jesus is seeing through this from a spiritual point of view and he's rebuking Satan. And what's happening is, is, is really Peter's kind of being uh, used here and manipulated by their human point of view to think from a unspiritual, ungodly sense because Peter doesn't think that that Jesus should die at all. He should live forever. That's what the Messiah would do. This is completely ruining his idea of what the Messiah is. And so he wrongly rebukes Jesus. He's wrong about what Jesus is supposed to do. The biggest issue that's going on is spiritual, not physical. And here's what it is. They were not conquered just by Rome at this time and oppressed by Rome. They were conquered and oppressed by their sin. And Jesus was coming to set them free from that, from their sin. And so he had to conquer the cross and then conquer death and rise again. They did not see it from that perspective. They had more of the satanic philosophy that you have a, a crown without a cross. That you, you can bypass pain and suffering, Jesus, by just ruling. And that's not at all God's plan or will for the Messiah. And so Jesus rebukes what Satan's trying to say to him through Peter, but he's also in a sense rebuking Peter for thinking in manly humanistic ways versus thinking what? God's ways and God's will. Because Satan doesn't want you and I to do God's will. And what he'll do is he'll tempt you with, hey, you don't have to go, you don't have to carry your cross. You can just, you can just put on the crown now if you want. But what happens in the end, that crown disappears and it burns with earth. And then you don't have what, G what Satan promised and you missed out on what Jesus promised. It was the same thing in the garden. Satan was trying to get Jesus to switch his loyalties, get everything now, and, and later he would not have it. And Jesus saw right through, uh, through Satan. And so now he's seeing right through this and he's confronting Satan. And unfortunately uh, as well, Peter had to be, <laughs> he had to be rebuked. Uh, 
in front of everyone. But he also is, is rebuked, uh, the disciples are rebuked as well in this context. So now Jesus doesn't just focus on his own suffering and what's gonna happen, how he's gonna be rejected, betrayed, and crucified. You ready for this? Now he goes and looks at the crowd, he calls the crowd together, and he calls his disciples together and he gets, he's getting ready to preach. What is the cost of being my disciple? What is the cost of following me? In church, just so you know, this translates to today as well. This translates to today. This is what he says. Then calling the crowd, verse 34, to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own ways or selfish ways, deny yourself, in other words, take up your cross and follow me. Now, Jesus is talking to a group of people who were following him because of one major thing. He keeps doing miracles and they like it. He keeps helping them. He's fed them. He's fed them bread, fish. He's taking care of their physical needs, but they're still missing their spiritual need. And so Jesus is confronting this comfort, this comfort and this, this wanting of Jesus for their physical need. And he confronts it and says, now you must deny self. If you want to truly be my follower, deny selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. Now they would know the cross. They would know what it means because Rome brutally crucified criminals on crosses all the time. Public display of suffering and death. And so when they hear him saying this, they, they realize that he is talking about identifying with Jesus and, and sharing in his suffering, being willing to carry their own cross and possibly even die, not just suffer, but die. Now, just so you know, this book was written by Mark during the times of Nero in around AD 55 to 68 or so. And Nero, as I've said before in this, in this church, he was the one who persecuted Christians severely. He would put Christians in arenas and lions would tear them apart. So Mark's audience who's, who's hearing this as well and learning this around this time when this book was written uh, through the inspiration of God, they, they know that, that they have to possibly suffer if they're gonna follow Jesus. That's, the, that's who Jesus is talking to then and even Mark's contemporaries and around his age and those people that were around him, they would understand that we may actually have to suffer under Nero's rule and die if we want to follow Jesus. And then of course, the last part is, don't just deny self, which by the way, if you're gonna take up the cross and follow Jesus, you kind of really have to do that because Jesus is counterculture and he's counter self and more about serving God and serving others. Take up your cross and then follow me. Be faithful to follow me. And this is what he says in the next verse. Let's move forward. If you try to hang on to your life, like physically hang on to your life or preserve it, but meaning you won't be following Jesus because you don't want to suffer, then you actually lose your life. It's kind of upside down world in this, in this verse. But if you give up your life, he's wanting us to think spiritual, not human perspective, but God view. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. So if we try to stay away from suffering and following Jesus, and we wanna to try to keep our life the way it is, even though Jesus is saying, let go of these things, he's telling them at this time, that you actually are going to end up falling for this world rather than following me, and you're gonna lose your life physically, you're gonna lose eternal life as well. But if you are willing to follow me, no matter what happens, no matter what suffering or maybe even death and the cross comes, guess what? You will save your life. You will gain eternal life. Now, how do we know he's saying that? Because of what's next. Verse 36, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything 
worth more than your soul. I want to go to, to Matthew chapter 13 to show you the value of having your soul, but more, more importantly, having the kingdom of heaven where your soul belongs. There's a parable that Jesus says in Matthew 13, 44. It won't be on the screen. I'm going to read it for you. Matthew 13, 44 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it, hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. I'm going to read the next one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. When you find God, when you find Jesus, he is a treasure worth giving up everything else for that treasure. Amen? <clears throat> Can I show you a picture? And I don't, I, I want to use this picture as an illustration. I'm not trying to be hard on, on this. I just... I love, I like this picture a lot. I like this message, but I think it has like humanistic views in it rather than godly views. Because I saw this around eight or so years ago and I was like, man, that is a powerful message right there. But I think the one I saw was the, the, the teddy bear was like broken or something. And so Jesus has this new teddy bear for this girl. And if she were just to trust him that he would give her even better. And you know, that is so true. If we choose Jesus, we will have eternal life. So true. But at the same time, I was reading, the second time I saw this in life, I was reading about the supremacy of Christ and that when you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. And so when I looked at this again the second time, I felt the Holy Spirit convict me and say, this picture is all wrong. Because what we need to give the girl is Jesus, not a bigger teddy bear. And it hit me. Like that's like American society is if you, if you follow Jesus, you just get a better teddy bear, but we forget that we actually get Jesus, which is even greater than the teddy bear. Amen. So cool picture. I agree. I'm not trying to be too hard on it, you know, but at the same time, let's not miss the bigger picture, the God view rather than the human view that you get eternal life and you get something better than a teddy bear, you get Jesus and eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, your family, your friends, that's worth, that is worth giving up the world for. That is worth denying self. That is worth taking up your cross and following Jesus is you get Jesus and eternal life. And with eternal life is something better than a teddy bear that you would win at some carnival. There's a a, a society, a kingdom, a community, an eternal kingdom of no pain, no suffering, joy. It's amazing. Unfortunately, I think sometimes we don't value our souls enough to think about the eternal place that they belong. And so we need to not underestimate or underappreciate the value of having Jesus versus trying to gain everything we can in this world. That's why Jesus says, is anything worth more than your soul? No, of course not. But is that how our lives are lived out? That we believe that our soul is worth giving up the things of this world so we can have eternal life. I pray that that is our heart. Now, verse 38 says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed, talking about Jesus, Jesus himself is the Son of Man, will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I shouldn't have, I should have go back to Matthew. Let me go back to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Right away, I thought this verse and I was, as I was studying this week. Matthew 10, verse 28. 
don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. Don't be afraid, let me, let me put this in there. Don't be afraid of those who come against you because of your beliefs. Don't be afraid of the world's slander. Don't be afraid of the world's opinions. Don't be afraid of the world's thoughts and persecution. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's a, that's a really honest statement from Jesus, isn't it? Let's not be ashamed, he's saying to his disciples. Don't be ashamed of me. If you are, I will be ashamed to acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. If you're ashamed to associate with me, if you're ashamed to, to acknowledge me here on earth and my message here on earth, then when I'm in heaven, I will be ashamed to acknowledge you before my Father in church. Just so you know, that is not a good thing. That is a bad thing. Because Jesus will say to people, I'm sorry, I never knew you. And they must go to hell. And that is from Jesus. That's not from someone else saying that. Jesus is saying this. That's why I said I love how Jesus is honest. He doesn't bait people in. He actually tells them up front that to follow me is to deny self, take up your cross and follow me, to deny the things of this world if it gets in the way of, of you worshiping me and to not be ashamed or embarrassed of me in front of those around you. So it's time to apply it to our lives. I've already kind of started <laughs> to do that. I had so many things to say, so I'm so glad that, uh, that the Holy Spirit's helped me to, to breeze through this. How do we apply this in a 21st century American culture? Well, I think we can do the basic things. Like, I believe we can, we can definitely deny our selfish ambitions, right? Amen? Like, especially if they're keeping us from serving God and, and serving others and following Jesus, we got to be careful that we, we deny uh, things that try to come up in front of God. And, and we, can, we could say, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter who comes against me, no matter what they say. I'm going to be loyal to Jesus more than anything, and I'm going to be obedient to follow him wherever he goes. But I don't know if we really live in a society where cross-bearing commitment is necessarily um, needed. I think it is needed, but I mean physically, like death. Let me explain. In, in Eastern Christian culture right now in Iran, you can be tortured and persecuted and killed if you identify as a Christian. So they're definitely carrying a cross of suffering and death, just so you know. China, India, Africa, places in Africa right now, they are carrying a physical cross, like spiritually, they could die for Jesus. Spiritually, they carry a cross, but physically they could die for Jesus. I don't know if we're at that place yet in America, but I kind of see that in, in future years, that could be an issue. Are you ready for that? Now, in America, we're seeing an increase of wickedness, blatant wickedness with no shame. Right? That's what we're seeing. Yeah. And you agree. I mean, that's what you're saying when you clap. You agree. Okay. Now, at the same time, what we're seeing is that more and more Christians are being silenced online or in circles, and we're being shamed for having our Christian views. So that is happening. And so that's the beginning of greater suffering and persecution for Christians. But for us, we count it a glory to suffer for Christ. We count it glory and we count it to celebrate a joy to suffer for Christ. I guess what I'm afraid of that's happening though in the church is that we're a little too intimidated by the loudness of our opposition and we're a little afraid to be bold about our faith. Now, I don't mean, now you need to listen to last week's message because <laughs> I don't mean judgmental and arrogant and hateful speech as a Christian. I mean love, yes. I mean care, sensitivity, truth. We gotta be true, we gotta speak the truth in love. 
all right? And we cannot be afraid of, of the people not liking us or being unfriended online or all those things. And then the other thing too is if someone does speak out for Jesus, we as a Christian, especially if they handle it well, like Jesus would, we should come along their side and encourage them and say, I back you up, I'm praying for you. Amen, I'm in your corner. Because it is coming, we are being silenced. If you have a view that's against some things in our society in America, you can be blocked on Twitter for 24 hours or longer. Without this person I saw, he, he, without, without any kind of condemnation or hate, it was not hate, it was not condemnation, but it was a view that Twitter doesn't like. But the Bible is clear on. And there was nothing wrong with what he said. I read it. He was, he's a very professional speaker for Christianity. He's an apologist. So he defends the faith, but he also speaks in love. He even, he even um, rebukes Christians and how they handle themselves online or in person. And he's, very, he's like me, you know, we got to look out for the church. We got to like call the church out when we need to, but then we can't be afraid to be real in our society. So when I saw his post, I couldn't believe that it was banned because of his comment. And so it's happening and that's happening all the time. And it's probably happening in your own circles if if you're living out loud for Jesus Christ. But I guess the other side of it that I'm concerned about is because we live in America, we can take on American society a little too much and get what I called, I called this to the youth. Uh, when, I, when I preached this uh, sermon on this text to the youth many years ago, I called it Snuggy Christianity. You know what Snuggies are? Oh my God, I, those, should, those should have never been sold. But if you own one, that's okay. I'm not judging you. They're pro- I'm sure they're comfortable. It's like this, this pajama looking thing. You zip up and you just snuggle in it and you can lay on your couch all day. Where am I going with that? That's, I call that, you know, just that's comfortable Christianity. And, I, and I'm a little concerned that, that we have adopted this snuggy Christianity, this comfort Christianity. Just so you know, comfort is the enemy of, the, of discipleship. Comfy, being comfortable is the opposite of what Jesus calls us to be. What am I saying? Um, It's not going to be easy to make disciples. It's going to take time and sacrifice. It's not going to be easy to serve God in this world. People are not going to like you. They're not going to agree with you. It's not going to be easy to speak the truth in love. Uh, We have to serve. We have to give of our finances we, we have to be available for people to help them know. We have to evangelize is what I'm saying too. We have to be available to evangelize. We need to spend time, instead of watching so much TV, reading the Bible with other people who need Jesus. Like we, we, we can't get so comfy that as soon as something's challenging, all of a sudden we put down a cross and go, well, I'm gonna be a sideline Christian and cheer from the sidelines. That's not what changed the world. These men were willing, and women, were willing to pick up the cross and follow Jesus and die. Like Peter, you're gonna learn in this play, he died for Jesus upside down on a cross. That is what we could end up seeing or our children could end up seeing. So if my children grow up in a home where I'm not willing to get a little uncomfortable for Jesus, what are they going to do when the Antichrist comes in and starts tempting them with ease? If we love this world too much, we'll get really comfortable in it and not be willing to suffer for Christ. And we end up losing our soul, but we could also teach our kids that this is the way, and that's not the way of the cross. That's the way of comfort. That's what I'm concerned of, and I say that all in love, just so you know. Because even I'm challenged by this, to get a little uncomfortable for Jesus more and more each day. And speak the truth in love. I guess I'm starting right now, ain't I? Even more. I'm just growing in that. Being real with us as the church. Well, I see that there in this scripture, Jesus confronts our comfort. Have you heard the story of the the crossroom? Let me share it with you. A young man was at the end of his rope 
seeing no way out, he dropped to his knees in prayer. Lord, I can't go on. I have too heavy a cross to bear. The Lord replied, my son, if you can't bear its weight, just place a cross inside this room, then open that other door and pick out any cross you wish. The man was filled with relief. Thank you, Lord, he sighed. And he did as he was told. Upon entering the other door, he saw many crosses, some so large that the tops were not visible. And then he spotted this tiny little cross leaning against a far wall. And he whispers to Jesus, I like that one. I want that one right there. And the Lord replied, my son, that is the cross you just brought in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> my dad told me that years ago. I just started cracking up. And I was like, that's funny. Not to judge what you're going through, but we all carry crosses. And we're never going to carry the cross Jesus carried. But God is inviting us, Jesus is inviting us to inherit eternal life, to change the world, flip it upside down for Jesus, and it's going to take discipleship. And the cost of discipleship is not easy. And so what I see here is a breakdown, and I'll quickly go through this, is a breakdown of the the perspective of you can have a human point of view or you can have a God point of view. Because Jesus said that to Peter, you have a human point of view and you need a God point of view. And so the first one is, is we can either have our selfish ways or God's ways. That's in verse 34 through 35. Followers of Jesus though are devoted to, to God's will versus their own will. Jesus isn't saying that we can't build a life here on earth. He's not, he's not saying that we can't have things. He's saying that we must deny them as our gods. He's saying don't worship yourself and don't love this world so much that you can't follow me. Instead, follow Jesus who loves and worships God. So follow Jesus and copy Jesus and what he did. Secondly, in verses 34 through 35, we see comfort and ease. You can choose comfort and ease or you can choose Christ and a cross. And we want Jesus without a cross too much in our world. We want crowns without crosses. We can't have salvation without repentance. We can't follow Jesus and expect no trials, sacrifices, or trouble. Following Jesus says, no matter what may come, you follow him. And the other comparison of human view or godly view is gain the world, but lose your soul or let go of this world, but gain eternal life. And lastly, you can be ashamed or embarrassed of Jesus or ashamed or unashamed, unashamed to praise and glorify his name. Meaning we, we choose to associate with Jesus. We choose to associate with God and his word even if it means losing human affirmation and relationships. Even if it means losing some friends because we stand on the word of God. You don't want to lose friends. You don't want to be told painful things. But Jesus endured and committed himself to the cross for our sake. Here's, I'm going to finish with a story, but let me say this. Jesus was committed to the cross for us. Let's be committed to carrying our cross for him. Amen. And what I love about it is, is that he helps you carry it. Because he's been through it. He can sympathize with you. He knows how to handle persecution and suffering and abandonment and rejection and betrayal. He knows how to handle it all. If you follow Jesus, you're going to carry a cross. He's going to ask you to do some hard things. It's going to get uncomfortable. But the beautiful thing is, is Jesus is right there. That's what I love. I want Jesus. So I'm willing to carry my cross wherever I need to go. All right. Let me tell you a story from one of our own that goes to church here. 
This is a picture of uh, Masango Bamba. We baptized her just two weeks ago here in our sanctuary. Bamba was born in the Ivory Coast, raised in a Muslim community and family. Women in her community and culture were not given access to education as boys were, and they were often kept home to be homemakers. This is a little disturbing. Girls as young as 12 would be given away to men for marriage in her community. Thankfully, because Mansango's father was educated, they were able to move away where she wasn't forced to study the Quran or be given away in marriage at a young age. Masango's father was too busy working, so no one was there to make sure she studied the Quran. That was helpful. But you know what's interesting when I read that? It's like, we are so busy, we're not teaching our kids the Bible. Anyway, those are the kind of things that God hits me with, you know. So her, mother, her mom never enforced it either because she was also conflicted with the whole religion. Family conflict and dysfunction was a big issue in her family and in the community. Because of what she grew up in, as Mansango got older, Christianity was looking more appealing. And I love that. Because true Christianity is, is appealing. It's not gonna be easy, but it is appealing compared to what she saw. It was shining in the darkness, so to say. This is what Mansango said, I quote, I forced myself on several occasions to try and practice Islam as I know it was a disgrace to be a Christian. Your family and the community would disown you if you dared. But deep down in my heart, I think I knew all along, I never fitted the mold for a good Muslim woman. I was too curious. <laughs> I asked too many questions and I personally never met an imam or kind of like their equivalent of a priest who was ever able to answer any of my questions. So she was asking a lot of questions and they couldn't answer. That changed when I had my first interaction with church folks. The pastors were kind and caring and didn't mind answering my questions. That solidified what had always been in my heart. I held on to that unbeknownst to my family. Masango would go on to marry a Christian man and has a 13 year old, and has a 13 year old boy named Moses today, which is awesome. But, in, but her faith in Christ was personal and real about three years ago. She said this, I realized that Jesus didn't care what I had done or not done, unlike man. I was thinking about him regularly and came to realize that I was getting comfort and strength in ways I had never felt before. I would pray to him constantly. I knew it was real when for the first time in my life, I went out and used my own money to buy and handpick out a Bible. I didn't care how much it was gonna cost me, she just wanted that Bible. I asked Mansango this question, or I asked her, how did Mansango's family take the news? And she replied, they were embarrassed. And up to this day, never really acknowledge it. They basically laugh it off. I get harassed because of it. They still try to force their ideology on me and constantly try to influence my child. I must say my earthly father has accepted it for the most part when he saw that I stood my ground. And when I asked Monsango why she endures this adversity from her own family, she said, because Jesus is my strength. I honest, yeah, praise the Lord. She goes on to say, I honestly am not afraid to lose anybody. Ooh, I like that. Lose your life for his sake. Because she said this, I'm not afraid to lose anybody because I have him. Through it all, he has always been there for me, even when I was ashamed to openly represent him. I get courage from his story. With everything that Jesus has been through without complaints, my tribulations are minuscule. When she shared this story with, uh, when she told us her story backstage before her water baptism, just briefly, she said this, she said those similar things, but she said, I do feel alone. And that broke my heart because that's, that's, that's why we're here as the church. And I'm not trying to end on a sad note because that's a beautiful story, right? Praise the Lord. But we were able to encourage her and say, sister, you're not alone. We're here for you as a church. But I gotta tell you, church, we gotta make that a reality too, amen? 
And so I'm going to challenge someone in the 11 o'clock, and I've already asked a family member, uh, one of our church members here, to adopt her and disciple her and her family. And so they've already committed to that. But we're going to see if someone in 11 o'clock service will take her out to lunch unless this family does or something like that, you know? Because we need to be the church that's together, okay? And when someone loses family members, they gain the family of Christ when it's a situation like this, amen? Amen. I'm challenged by that to help us all and make sure we all love on people because we don't know what people are giving up to follow Jesus. That's why we need to love each other, be there for each other, help one another because it's not easy to follow Jesus, is it? And guess what, church, uh, not just not that I'm some great person or something like that, but I'm here with you. I'm here for you too. So is our staff. But most of all, together, we need to be here for each other because more and more people are going to continue to find Jesus and they need our encouragement. I want to challenge us all to choose Christ, to deny selfish things that get in the way of following Jesus, to be willing to follow Jesus, even if it means persecution or ridicule, family disowning us. Be faithful to him and go wherever he wants you to go. Do whatever he wants you to do. Sound good? Sounds interesting too. Sounds like a good challenge, but we're going to have Jesus with us the whole way. Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand together as we close in prayer? Jesus, first of all, we want to thank you for being committed to the cross. Even before it happened, you knew what was coming and you were committed to go through the rejection, the betrayal, and the crucifixion. After helping people like us, you still went through it. Thank you for being so committed to God's will. Thank you for following God's plan. Jesus, help us to do the same thing for you. And God, we commit ourselves to start denying things. We know this is a process, God. We know this is going to take time in a daily commitment of picking up our cross and following you. So help us to deny those things. Help us to align ourselves with the path of the cross. And thank you for the great reward that we will have eternal life with you. Lord, help us to keep our mind not on, one, on the human point of view, but God, your point of view. God, help us to choose your way instead of ours. I thank you for this church, God, who's willing to follow you no matter what. Prepare us for the days ahead. Again, thank you for this message and this encouraging word. We're not in this alone. We're in it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you. 